What is going on, everybody? On today's episode of Invasive Brews, I'm going to be studying a species that I, as a landowner and as a property manager, have dealt with for many years, and I know a lot of my friends do as well that are in the agriculture business. And I want to show you my favorite place to get a good beer. So, without further ado, let's get into it. It's an icon of the American West, the tumbleweed. But this annual plant is far from an American native. Brought over in the early 1900s as an ornamental plant from Eurasia, kochia has rolled over a majority of the country. It causes headaches for homeowners and financial loss for businesses and farmers. When tumbleweeds are burying a New Mexico town, Clovis City officials say the whopping weeds are covering homes and blocking streets. And as News 13's Emily Younger found out, the worst of it might not be over. Throughout the Great Plains, this is becoming more of a common sight. This is all kochia. And each one of these plants has the capability of producing upwards of 20,000 seeds. That is a huge seed bank compared to native plants. This plant's physiology gives it the advantage in these areas. During hot, dry weather, this plant can rapidly grow, whereas native plants, they slow down their growth rate or they just dorm, go dormant and shut off their growth altogether, quickly giving this the advantage. And when it becomes mature, it breaks off in the wind, becomes the symbolic tumbleweed, distributing all those 20,000 seeds. And you can see how big it gets. This isn't even how as big as it gets. It can get up to, you know, seven foot tall. And in dry conditions, the taproot can get, go down as far as 16 feet. Besides all the time and money spent on mowing and spraying for homeowners, tumbleweeds can also cause damage to fence lines and even vehicles. But it's our farmers that pay for this invasive species introduction the most. With the increasing cost of herbicides and equipment, Kosha is one of the many reasons small farmers are hurting. And that trickles down to everyone. If the farmers hurt, we hurt. Luckily, I know a few that'll take me to the front lines battling this and many other invasive weeds. One key piece of equipment that farmers need is a sprayer that can cost upwards of $500,000. And that's not even including all of the chemical that has to go in it. Chemicals can cost anywhere from $44 a gallon to upwards in the hundreds a gallon. So does this also hit like vine weed? And oh yeah, yeah, this mix will kill. We've got uh, broadleaf control and grass control in this too. Um, you said you had how many acres of corn this year? 3,800. 3,800, that's a lot. You know, what sucks is when it has 50,000 plant or seeds per plant, uh -huh. and then it rolls across your field during the winter. <laughs> yep. Oh, yeah. Whenever that kochia starts to germinate and come up out of the ground, you can see lines of them, and that's from the weeds rolling across the field. Russian thistle. Yeah, thistle's a big one. Uh, th thistle's a little easier to control though, so we don't really have a huge problem with it on the farm. It's not resistant like the like the kosher is. So on average, how much do you think you spend on chemical? Oh man, uh, that's hard to say. Um, I've got my own. Me and Adam have our own farm. And just on our farm, I think we're right at 800 acres of corn. And just on the corn, it's, you know, these weeds are uh, building resistance to all of our chemical. It used to be 30 years ago, you could come out with Roundup and kill everything. Just Roundup. And now, they, that was the first thing they built resistance to. And then, you know, we had 2,4-D and 
and dicamba, which is in that jug, that still works. Well, not on kosher. Kosher is a very, uh, what's the word, a very resilient weed. And, uh, but those, those two chemicals, they're broadleaf. They, they have broadleaf control. And, uh, Kosha and the pigweeds are now starting to build resistance to those two chemicals. And the only chemicals that are left are the expensive ones. And farming's not quite as profitable as it was 30 years ago. That's why whenever you say, you know, 3,800 acres is a lot, that's what it takes. Some of these smaller farms, I, I don't see how they turn a profit, you know, enough of a profit. Kosha does have a forage value. Um, livestock do eat it and while it's young or the new shoots, um, but once it becomes, you know, this tall, that doesn't really have uh, the, the forage value that livestock like. Um, it becomes bitter tasting. Um, and too much of kosher, too much of uh, kosher in the diet can become toxic. But in the, in the 1930s, uh, it was known as poor man's alfalfa because farmers would bale Russian thistle and kosher and it saved their cattle herds from starvation during the huge droughts of the 1930s, the dirty 30s. Now there are some uh, native species that are taking advantage of kosher's uh, forage value. I like the this woolly bear here. And grasshoppers will enjoy them and you know birds like quail and uh, songbirds, migratory songbirds, um, ground nesting birds will forage on the seeds during the winter. But with a stand like this and 20,000 seeds per plant, um, birds and this guys like this aren't going to be able to um, control uh, this species as, as of now. All right, little man. Do work. And since the tumbleweeds are so numerous around here, it's only fitting that Garden City, Kansas names an entire music festival after them. And after spraying weeds all day in the heat, everyone needs a cold beer. And here in Garden City, the grand opening of Hidden Trail Brewing is underway. I don't have like a whole lot to say. Just kind of wanted to let everyone know we're not the traditional, typical business people, and this isn't going to be a typical, traditional business in this town. Uh, anyone that's ever felt like they haven't had a place to hang out or to be at, this is your place. We work really hard to make this vision exactly what we wanted it to be. September 2020, we were right on the other side of that wall kind of pitched our plan to everyone and everyone seemed to really like that idea and it took us a little bit longer to open than we thought but we're really happy with the new product because it's exactly what we wanted so we have a little bit unconventional ribbon cutting as well His are the really safety scissors right now. So the three of us were all co-workers at a previous location and uh, we decided at almost the same time to move on and start our own business and make our own footprints in this town. And it became quite easy because everything uh, from the city to of the community and from our friends kept falling into our lap and just pushing us along the way and supporting us in every way that any way that they could and so we came here we found this barn after Michael and Cody did some research uh, on some different properties that would have been astronomical prices that we would have never been able to afford we found this barn and moved forward with it and started from literally the the walls down. We tore down the walls personally and um, then we found the right uh, contractors to come in and start putting stuff together for us. And here we go. It ended never. It's never going to end. <laughs> We're just absolutely blown away from the response we've gotten from the community, 
Um, like Colin said, everyone's been welcoming us with open arms. They've been supporting us from day one. And now that we're open, it's really nice to get to see those same people come in here and enjoy the space that we've worked so hard to build for them. So just really happy to be here and really glad that people are getting behind our vision. Yeah, and uh, we got to build a brewery that we wanted. Uh, some places decided to tuck their brewery equipment into the corner of the, the place where we really thought that we should showcase it and uh, that way we can show people what our passion truly is and how the process is actually made and they get, if we're working late one night then while people are here drinking they see us working and getting it done. I really like everything that Garden City is doing but something I hear a lot of is people say uh, we know we have a lot of restaurants which I disagree with but they say it's not a place to hang out so we really wanted a bar that was kind of the idea of a coffee shop mixed with a bar of like this is your hangout spot so your name is your tab you can move around table to table you can bring in your own food you can have food delivered we have tequila's menus we have Pinky's menus, they run food over here on top of the food trucks, but just kind of wanted it to be board games, family friendly, um, kind of a place for people just to hang out. And, and that is just what Hidden Trail has become to me, is my hangout spot, a place where I can get together with friends and family, have a great time, enjoy each other's company, even play some games. The overall atmosphere just makes anybody feel welcome and as if they are everybody's best friend. Only good beers! Only good beers! Only good beers! Purchasing new ones.